between now and April 1, Congress has to act when that cliff occurs, we go off the cliff. Um, I expect they will act, but when's another matter? Uh, I'm not too uh, hopeful about them acting this year during the lame duck session. Now, there seems to be a lot of consensus that SGR is broken, SGR should be gotten rid of, SGR should be replaced. A reasonable amount of consensus on what might follow, uh, though I think it's not perfect. Uh, but the worst problem is this costs a lot of money and maybe as much as 125 billion or whatever. So Congress, for 10 years, so Congress needs to find a fair amount of money uh, in order to pay for the SGR reform. And while there are people on the Hill who are still talking about doing this and not paying for it, I don't think that will prevail. And so this is the key stumbling block on getting an SGR uh, reform bill through Congress, is who's going to finance it. And as you might imagine, it's going to have to be somebody else because it isn't going to be, you know, everybody wants someone else to be responsible for this amount of money. So let me leave that, and I'm certainly happy to answer your questions. And I've got only this slide, and again, I wanted to just touch on an issue because uh, here's an issue that is a coverage issue. We haven't talked about much in the way of coverage issues. And this is one that's active, and this is the area of pneumatic compression devices, and this is an area where the DME uh, Medicare contractors have responsibility, and all four of them came out with a future local coverage determination not too long ago that basically says that DPMs, uh, in their scope of practice, uh, it does not uh, really allow them to prescribe these uh, pneumatic compression devices for their patients, and that future policy was to uh, have been effective right now. So by November 1, this was supposed to be in place. When this came out, there was a flurry of activity within APMA. Uh, a protest was lodged with CMS. In addition, uh, uh, they requested a reconsideration by uh, the DME Max. And uh, fortunately, uh, the DME Max clearly, we, they've gotten some, of the, their, people have gotten their attention, and so they suspended this policy, and they have not set a new uh, timeline, but it's still a risk. There's still this threat out there that this no, new coverage policy would take effect. Uh, at the moment, I would say we have a skeptical audience at the Medicare contractors as well as at CMS. And it's this no, notion that um, this, these devices are being used and the issue is there's a systemic condition and there's also, they argue, the potential for systemic complications that would be beyond the scope of the diet. And so putting it all together, that's where the contractors come out. But as you can imagine, this could be very precedential because all of a sudden if you're treating uh, a, a, a foot manifestation of diabetes but you don't treat diabetes, you're not the diabetologist, then somebody could say, well, you shouldn't be treating the foot either because, you know, you don't treat diabetes. I mean, it's kind of silly, but this is kind of the logic uh, that, that's being put together uh, for this. Um, so, uh, you know, I think whatever evidence, let me put it this way, whatever evidence they can make and get that is within scope for a number of states, that bolsters this case that this policy is unreasonable. It doesn't have to be every state because you know, all the contractors would have to do is what they've done for some other specialties is to simply say, if it's in scope, it's okay. If it's not in scope, it's not covered by Medicare. And that would be kind of a more traditional uh, approach as opposed to a declaration that nationwide this is not in scope. And that's a judgment that the contractors would make. Yeah. Every two things on this subject. So is the rule suspended that we can do it or we can't do it? You, you can't. So there's no change in policy right now. So the national coverage decision on this topic allows physicians to do it. It doesn't say anything about it. There's no problem. What, we're, what they're trying to get is what the contractors are saying here is we don't think it's in your scope. So you prove to us it's in your scope. And so that's what's sort of in, in play in a number of places. And the other thing I was really planning to ask. Uh, under the ACM model, physicians are encouraged to be, quote, more efficient, bill less, and then we'll get some money on the back end. Do statistics show that the more efficient doctor who gets money on the back end is making more or less money than the normally practicing physician? What is the incentive for the doctor, though, who's making less but being more efficient? 
Well, that's a very good question. Let me start to answer it this way. One of the things that is probably more likely to occur, uh, and there's fair evidence, is that if people do a good job, we're going to reduce hospital admissions and readmissions. And so the hospitals are very worried that, yes, there's shared savings, but you know what happens to those shared savings? I've lost revenues but my lost revenues are someone else's shared savings. And so, but, but that's only one possibility. There are all the other ones that you start to think about, you know, and also I think that um, what can happen is changes in referral practices too. All of a sudden the ACO folks might say, oh, I don't want to send my patients over there, you know, they, they, they're, they offer too many services or they're too expensive or whatever, I'm going to send my patients over here. And, and some of my physical therapy uh, friends are telling me, you know, our group used to get a lot of referrals, we're not getting those referrals anymore because they're going to another physical therapy group that's part of the ACO. We're not part of the ACO, so they're part of the ACO, we're not. So again, all kinds of things I think can happen. So let me just finish and then I'll open it up. Uh, question that I have with all these new models coming in and trying to decrease uh, cost and saving and being rewarded for that, what happens to the high risk patients, the, the uncontrolled diabetic, the uh, non compliant patient, the, the uncontrolled hypertensive? What happens to those individuals when a physician is treating them and it takes them a lot longer than, let's say, the 40 year old? individual who's really taking care of his body, he can do it in one or two visits, and the other one takes him a half a year, and then he has to send him to the hospital, the complications. How is those gonna fall through the cracks? How is that gonna help healthcare in this country? Well, that's an issue that people have raised, and um, there are different responses. And I think the Innovation Center would say to you, uh, well, those are the patients that, if they're properly cared for, are most likely to redu you could reduce expenditures. And so the whole area that the program is very interested in is uh, this whole area of uh, sort of unnecessary admissions. Uh, so that if you have a condition, and if I really got to you sooner and paid better attention, that maybe I could avoid the need for you to be admitted to the hospital. Well, the guy so, has to come to you. And this kind of reminds me of when I was in college and I took education classes, and they said, you know, if you make things interesting, students would uh, appreciate and be unru not be unruly. But the point is, if you go to an inner city school and they're throwing papers and knives at you and whatever, to get them under control, that's the issue first in order for them to pay attention. And this is the same thing. They have to come into the drawing. They have to be motivated to do it. Well, you know, it's, it's also very complicated because, and I didn't get into this, but let's just back up for a minute. You're an ACO. Who are your patients? Well, you're going to find that out at the end of the year. I know you say, well, that, no, you're crazy. Well, in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, the way the formula works, at the end of the year, we look to see where that patient went for their primary care. And based on where they went for their primary care during the pre previous year, then we determine which group is responsible and if it's an ACO. So ACOs legitimately are saying, uh, wait a minute, I want to know up front, because otherwise it's sort of a guessing game. Yeah, maybe I have a good sense, because the program does give feedback. The program is saying, well, historically, these have been your patients. So there is that information, but there's no ironclad guarantee, and that's because uh, when this was created, Congress didn't want a new Medicare Advantage program. They wanted the beneficiary to retain freedom of choice. And, and like everything else, you can't have it all. You know, So if the patient's got freedom of choice, I can't sort of say this. you only can go to the ACO. And in fact, we know the ACOs are not providing all the care because they, they, don't, they either can't or don't feel they need to. They're just accountable for all of it. So when I do my tally sheet, even if they went to somebody outside the ACO, what happened there gets tallied up in determining whether I get shared savings or not. So there's a lot of things. I don't know who my patients are for sure, uh, and there's a lot of debate. Are, they, are, are people who are really sick are going to be avoided? Now, the program has said very explicitly to the ACO community, we're going to be watching. We're going to be monitoring. If, if, if you start you know, uh, changing the way that you're treating the higher risk patients and all, we're going to be on top of you. Now that's what they're saying. Now it's, it's always easier to say we're monitoring, more difficult I think to really uh, say, well, we know what went on and you shouldn't have done that or you should have done something different. Uh, 
Uh, you had your hand up, and then I'll go to Harry. Thanks. Standing so, patient. two questions, two issues actually. Number one, we're talking about evaluated modifier quality and cost. So, issues number one. So, if you could address some of the qualities that are being looked at in terms of determining high quality uh, outcomes. But then, in the context of outcomes, in the outcome, in the context of cost. If you have somebody as an example with heel pain and they go to an orthopedist and the orthopedist says, well, listen, all you, you know, they come in for an office visit and they say all you need to do is stretching and whatever and then you know, if you're not better in three months then you can come back and see me. Whereas they go to a podiatrist and then they actually treat them aggressively and get them back into the, either the workforce or into the life force and have a more active lifestyle where they're healthier, where they're walking more, where they're less risk of hypertension and diabetes and obesity and osteoporosis and all the other things. How does that factor in? Where does that, how do you determine in terms of outcome and high quality and low cost and all that? Okay. Uh, well, for the next hour, I will be responding to this question. <laughs> uh, no, I, I can't, of course, but let me be brief about it, but hopefully helpful. So let's talk quality for a minute. So the simple part of the quality uh, methodology is that if you report PQRS data for those certain measures, those data are going to be taken into account. And you're going to, they're going to look at those data, how well you did versus the national average. That's pretty simple. You get to choose which PQRS measures you want to send in. And you'll be judged on quality based on what you send in. So that's the simple part. In addition, there's some other so-called quality measures, there's outcome measures that you have no control over and they are calculated based on claims. And they really look at two kinds of things, avoidable admissions for certain conditions, uh, for example, uh, bacterial pneumonia, and avoidable admissions for certain conditions like diabetes. Okay. So, uh, and so they're going to simply look at the claims data they have and make that assessment and do that calculation. There's one other problem though, and it's going to affect you, I think. It's not maybe a problem, but the way I assign uh, the patients to you uh, will be based on where, the, you know, I assign patients to a group or physician based on their primary care, okay? So more than likely for many measures under the value modifier, Patients won't be assigned to podiatry practices. So there will be no data, which means that for quality, you're primarily going to probably end up being judged based on the PQRS measures. That may be good news. I think there's a few wrinkles. And, and one of the problems with this is still being rolled out, so we really don't have a good sense yet. Uh, once we do all the calculations, does everybody flunk? <laughs> you know? <laughs> So we have to, I still reserve a lot of judgment about that. So, so that's the quality side. Uh, and the other piece, in, in addition to avoidable admissions, they're going to look at all readmissions, hospital readmissions. But again, for that group, it's only the patients that get assigned to it or attributed to it based on where the patient got primary care. And I would think that very few patients will be assigned to the typical DPM practice. That will also be true for other specialists. Uh, so this system, I think really works better for primary care than it does for just about anybody else. But we're applying it to everybody because that's what the law says. Okay, that's the quality side. Let me do the cost side real quickly. There's measures on the quality side that look at total costs of care, that look at total costs of care for certain chronic conditions like diabetes, and that look for what's called Medicare spending per beneficiary. Now that's a measure that gears off of inpatient admission. And the group that gets credit or responsibility for that admission is the group that had the most allowed charges during the inpatient stay. So again, I would predict that only rarely will such a patient be assigned to a DPM practice. Instead, for that, it's more likely they're going to be assigned to somebody else. So again, and all, all, the, cost, all the other cost measures are assigned, again, based on how we run the ACO program, or, or vari a variant of that, actually. So again, based on primary care. So again, for the cost measures, they may not work at all for podiatry, the ones we got now. And some of the quality measures may not work for podiatry that we have now. So we may be left in the short term only with the PQRS measures being relevant to the calculation. And I don't know if that's good news or bad news. Uh, but that may be the reality. But again, I've got, we've got to see more data to know what, what's really going on. Uh, 
Um, the good news, again, to go back is for 2017, practices of less than 10 are not going to be negatively affected by the value modifier unless they fail to meet the PQRS reporting requirements, which is something you can control, I mean, to some extent. So I think at least that gives us a little cushion and a little time to, 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 uh, to think further about all this. And I have no doubt this program could easily be modified all along the way. So, you know, as people get more information or as maybe Congress weighs in or whatever, that we could see some dynamics and changes even before we get to 2017. So, yeah. Harry's been very patient, so I yeah. will let him go next. Two quick uh, questions. Uh, you mentioned one of your earlier slides, uh, the uh, episode of CARE. Now, my understanding of the what? episode of episode. CARE. Okay. And, and my understanding of episode of CARE from a facility standpoint is easy. It's admission to discharge. Then you mentioned that it could be applied to outpatient. What is an episode of care in outpatient? It, is it from I've found the problem and, I'm resolve, and I've resolved the problem, or is it a single day? No, it probably wouldn't be a single day. Um, so that the, the model that's working now in the in, using the inpatient is they start with the inpatient stay, and then they go up 30, 60, or 90 days. So not necessarily everything, but certain things that occur during 30, 60, and as long as 90 days after discharge are all subsumed in the bundle. And of course, in most cases, the bundle includes services that are provided by lots of different folks. So it's not like a variation of a global fee. It's all provided by one person. So, but your, your question's very good, and I think it's the question they're wrestling with, too. If they want to apply bundle payment to the outpatient setting, what does that mean, and how does that work? And I think that's sort of up in the air right Well, now. I'm bringing it in the context because the same terminology is used in ICD-10, and it, you know, I didn't realize whether or not it actually is a consistent definition, or does it kind of modify itself depending on the situation, which, which makes it confusing. Well, it probably would modify itself. I mean, when the innovation centers to kind of test this, there are probably going to be lots of variations. Because when they requested participants for this other inpatient side of the equation, they said to those applicants, you tell us what you think the bundle is going to include. Is it 30 days, 60 days, you want to go to 90? And you tell us if there are things you want to back out. In other words, if a claim comes in, it's not going to count against the bundle. Of course, CMS, the Innovation Center, reserved judgment about what the final bundle was. And oh, by the way, the price of admission to play under this model is you had the promise of discount. So, you know, they had the data of what they were going to would pay, you had to give them a discount. And, and, but still, they felt that that was, uh, clearly lots of organizations are interested. And my last question, which I bring up every year to you, is, in the past year, has CMS come up with any evidence, any studies, that shows there has been a significant outcome difference with PQRS since its innovation? Yeah. Now, well, you know, I, the, yeah, we do this every year, so I know. But, 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 but you know, I was thinking, I was, you know, in a way, I was thinking about this very issue as I was looking at the reg, the final rule that just came out. And one of the things that I didn't talk about today is Physician Compare. And Physician Compare is a website CMS has developed at Congress's request to begin to populate that site with performance data for physicians and others. And they're beginning that process. But it's a very ambitious, some would say aggressive a plan to share with the public all kinds of performance data, some of which would come from PQRS. And then we can debate whether, you know, what does that all mean. But um, they are continuing to move forward. I mean, I, the, the problem with PQRS certainly has partially been it's been totally voluntary up until recently. Uh, a lot of folks have not participated. Uh, people tell me in hallways that, well, I'm sending in these data, they're really not important, but, you know, I'm sending in data. You know, they want data, I'm sending them data, you know? So there's a lot of issues with PQRS, but I think that now that it's essentially mandatory, and now that we're going to move to publicly disclose the data and compare that data with national averages, it's going to increase the dynamic. Now, I don't know if that's going to get to your point. Well, but my point is evidence. 
I mean, we're held to evidence in our particular uh, being uh, positions out there, and there are, are no studies that show less people fall, and less people uh, smoke, and less people this and that and everything else. In fact, it really hasn't impacted anything other than the money going out, but now it's going to be a disincentive. You would think that someone would say, here are the studies that absolutely show we have done a good thing here and made uh, quality the king. One area though, you know, let's take the um, ACO world. I mean, what they have said is, and those are very similar measures, they have said that the ACOs are improving their performance on certain quality measures. Now, there's only 33 measures that have been used in the ACO, uh, and they're not necessarily all identical to PQRS type measures. And, and the program is also pretty proud, and probably rightly so, that readmissions are falling, that they're seeing some evidence that as they are putting pressure on people that some things are changing. Now, I think we still need more time to understand you know, what's happening and is it all good news or not. Uh, but, but I think there's some, some things that you can point to that suggest that you know, it matters. Um, you know, people say you, know, you get what you measure, and so we may have problems with what we're measuring, actually. And I know the program wants to move to outcome measures away from process measures, but it's, uh, those are harder. Those are harder to do. We'll see you next year. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to get the date so I can be out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned the difference between bundling and global periods. But the bundling is including a global period, 60, 90 days, tell us what you want. On the other hand, they're saying, let's get rid of the global periods. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, 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 that conflict has been pointed out to CMS, and I think that's why a number of people were surprised they wanted to do away with the global fiscal bundles, because they want to bundle other things. And the very same things could happen there. I create a bundle, and I pay you. Uh, maybe you don't provide all the services in the bundle, but the bundle's almost intentionally designed to make sure you don't, because they felt that we're paying too much. So, you know, it's an interesting dynamic, and, and, and there is a conflict. The program believes they're not in conflict. So. Yes, can't be a conflict. It's a CMS. There's a, if you go, well, it, this, there's not a simple answer to your question. Uh, but, but on the CMS website, there's a load of information about QRURs and also about how to get it. You have to have an account, so you have to apply for that account, and, and all of this is done online, and ultimately you can get access to your QR you are. Uh, but it's not sent to you, and you know, you've got to actively go seek it. So it has, it has great information about what the QR you are has, what the methodology is. I mean, there's reams of, of things you can download. It's, it's actually quite good. Just one more, one more question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. When does that change the sunshine? Well, that's a good question. What they kind of said in the final rule, but they said it um, in a little bit of a verbal way, would be January 2016. Okay. However, the answer they gave, in my judgment, applies now. Because the answer says, we don't need to do anything special. Because, you know, it's not an indirect payment. It's not a direct payment. So if you do A, B, and C, you shouldn't have to report. So I think the answer is going to be people are going to be consulting their lawyers, all these manufacturers, or maybe CMS will put out an FAQ or whatever. Uh, but the change, the effect, because they also made a number of other changes in Sunshine Act reporting that affects the manufacturers. And all of those are made effective January 1, 2016, because they want to give people time to get ready and to do it. Um, but again, for the CME, I would think the level playing field has pretty much been restored by the answer they gave. But I'm not a lawyer, so.